saying, Father, I'll go, and I'll pay the sin debt on Calvary slow. I'll bury my body, the marks of the cross, to save that person who is sin sick and lost. And it's still the blood that saves from sin and That brings victory to me. There are those who rely on the works that they do. And some men count on the times they break through. But when the battle's over and the last song is sung, I'll go home through the blood of the Father's precious Son. And it's still the blood that saves from sin, and it's still the blood that cleanses within, from the highest star in heaven to the depths of the sea. It is still the blood of Jesus that brings victory to me. And it's still the blood the saves from sin and it's still the blood that cleanses within from the highest star in heaven to the depths of the sea it's still the blood of jesus that brings victory to me Take your Bible this morning, if you would, please, for our scripture reading to Romans chapter 16, please. Romans chapter 16 for the scripture reading. We're going to read verses 24 through 27, verses 24 through 27 of Romans 16. I'll read verse 24. You join me on 25. I'll read 26, and we'll end together on verse 27. All right, as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing pleased to read God's word, and I'll begin on verse 24. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here this morning. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to make our hearts ready and prepare us to receive the truth from your word. Lord, we want our heart to be in tune with your heart, want our thoughts to be in tune with your thoughts. Lord, thank you already for the good music today and for the message in each song that has helped us and encouraged us and and turned our heart and our thoughts towards you. And I pray, Lord, that you'd use the special now as it's sung that each of us would ask you to 
Help us to focus on you and what you would want to say to us this morning through your word. Bless the special now to that end. In Jesus' name, amen. Once my soul was astray from the heavenly way and was wretched and vile as could be. But my Savior in love gave me peace from above when he reached down his hand for me. When my Savior reads down for me, when he reads way down for me, I was lost and undone without God or his Son when he reads down his hand for me. I was near to despair when he came to me there, and he showed me that I could be free. Then he lifted my feet, he gave me gladness complete when he reached down his hand for me. When my Savior reached down for me, when he reached way down for me, I was lost and undone without God or his Son when he reached down his hand for me. Oh, how my heart does rejoice when I hear his sweet voice. In the tempest to him I then flee, there to lean on his arm, safe, secure from alarm, since he reached down his hand for me. When my Savior reads down for me, when he reads way down for me, I was lost and undone without God or his Son when he reached down his hand for me. Oh, I was lost and undone without God or his son when he reached down his hand for me. Amen. Amen. Our Father, we bow in prayer now and we thank you, Lord, for your willingness to <clears throat> reach down and save each one of us. And Lord, my prayer this morning would be if any are in the room and they have never understood that you reach down in salvation for them, that Lord, they would understand their eyes, their understanding would be an open this morning that Jesus Christ died for them, was buried and rose again the third day. And now he's able to save all those that come unto God by him. I pray for your help now as we open up your word together. Lord, I'm asking you to walk up and down the aisle and in and out of each row and stop at every occupied seat and minister to the people there. Do in these next few minutes what only you can do. May the Spirit of God help us this morning and may holy decisions be made for you today. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. <clears throat> if your Bible's open to Romans chapter 16, at the end of this epistle, <coughs> excuse me, Paul, uh, the Holy Spirit, has in pen what's called a doxology. It happens at the end of an epistle. It means to speak praise or to give glory. There's a doxology that sometimes in churches we sing, 
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's a doxology. And uh, some of you shaking your heads, you've sung that before, sometimes at the close of services. You know, it, it, it means that we're giving God praise. We're giving God blessing. Praise in the Bible is mentioned 218 times. And 132 of those times, it's in the Psalms. And, and at the very closing Psalms, you know, there's a lot of repetition of giving God praise. In fact, Psalm 150 ends by saying, let everything that hath breath do what? Praise the Lord. Okay? And so God inhabits the praises of His people. Now, the, the word praise comes from a Latin word mean, meaning pretium. It means price. The word prize comes from the same word that we get our word praise. So in other words, it, it originally meant to set a great price on. When we praise someone, we're setting a great price on them. And here, Paul <clears throat> is offering his praise to God. He's setting a great price on God. When we praise God, we're setting a great price on His acts and His thoughts toward us. The Duke of Wellington, who is a great British military leader, he's the one who defeated Napoleon at Waterloo. He was not an easy man to serve under. He was brilliant, but he was very demanding. He was not one to ever shower any compliments on his subordinates. Even Wellington knew that his methods left something to be desired. In his old age, someone asked him what, if anything, he would do differently if he had to live his life over again. And General Wellington thought for a moment, and then he said, yeah, I would give more praise. I would give more praise. And I, I thought about that, and if you think about your life, no matter where you are in life, if you say, if you could change anything, if you could do anything differently, I think most of us would agree with the statement, I think I could give more praise. Whether it's praise to others, praise to God, I could just give more praise. Now, Paul gives us some words that we can praise God for. When the Bible says we're to give praise to God, there's certain things that we ought to center our praise on. I call it the vocabulary of praise. These are the words that are used that which we can praise God for. He gives them to us here in Romans chapter 16. Notice verse 24. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. The grace. That's the first word. Grace. I don't know there's a better word or a sweeter word than you and I than the word grace. Grace. Undeserved, unmerited favor of God. Undeserved, unmerited love of God. Undeserved, unmerited help of God. I like the idea of grace is God's sufficiency for my insufficiency. God's grace. The difference in your life now and your life when you were an unbeliever apart from God and apart from Christ, the difference is grace. God's grace on you. 170 times in the Bible the word grace appears. 39 of them are in the Old Testament. Lest you think there was no grace in the Old Testament. Paul said, it's by the grace of God, I am what I am. It's by the grace of God, you are what you are. And I am what I am. There's several kinds of grace that we could talk about. And, and I think we get an idea here when he says, it's the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, I see their sovereign grace. That's why he says, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace begins and ends with our Lord. Man does not initiate salvation, God does. Man does not provide the means for salvation, God does. Man does not 
seek God. God is seeking man. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. God is seeking mankind. God saw the need of man. God knew that man needed a Savior. And God has provided the Savior that man needed. It all has come from God. The songwriter said, Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. That was God. That was all on God's part. Initiating salvation to you and me. It's Sovereign grace simply means it's all on God's part. It's not on our part. It all comes from God. Nobody here today says, I deserved to be saved. If we all got what we deserved from a holy and righteous God, we would deserve to die and be punished in hell for our sin. For we're guilty sinners in the sight of God. Well, why, why aren't we going to hell? Why aren't we going to die and go to hell? Because the grace of God appeared in the Lord Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Grace. That's sovereign grace. But it's also saving grace because he said it's not just the Lord, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus. What did the angel say to Joseph? Thou shalt call his name Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus is the Savior. He came to save us from our sins. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Hey, He came and He taught, and none taught better, but He didn't come to teach. He came and He was an example. None lived better than Christ, but He didn't come just to be an example. He came and He did miracles. No one ever showed more power than Jesus did. But He didn't just come to do miracles. He didn't just come to teach. He didn't just come to be an example. He came to die. He came to be the sacrifice for our sins. He came to be our substitute and to die on the cross in our place. The innocent for the guilty. The pure for the impure. The clean for the unclean. The holy for the unholy. That's grace. John Newton said that's amazing grace. Amazing grace. The man who wrote that song, once an infidel, a slave trader in Africa, saved by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, restored, pardoned. On his, on his uh, tombstone it says this, John Newton, clerk, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. That's all in his tombstone. That must be a pretty good sized stone, I guess, if you have all that on there. But isn't that, isn't that something? God didn't free him to serve no master. He freed him to serve a new master. And he served the Lord Jesus Christ. For by grace are ye saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Thank God for saving grace. Thank God for sovereign grace. But thank God for satisfying grace. It's the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is the anointed one. He's the King. That's why He's able to meet and exceed all of our needs. Do you understand? He's able to take us through the world. He's able to carry us through whatever this life brings us, whatever the trials there are that life has. His grace is sufficient for every need. When Paul had his thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and he wanted God to take it away, God said, no, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace will help you to bear that. God's grace is is always sufficient. God's grace is always satisfying. Hebrews 4 and verse 16. Would you look there? We'll come back to Romans, so just put, put a piece of paper in there, put a finger in there. 
And look with me at Hebrews chapter 4. It's a familiar verse to you, but I'd like you to see it. Hebrews 4 and verse 16. If you're there, you can say amen. Okay. Hebrews 4 and verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find what? Find grace to help in time of need. You say, well, I, I don't know about His grace being satisfying. I don't know His grace being sufficient. Where do I get such grace? You get it from the throne of grace. You come boldly to the throne of grace. You'll obtain mercy and you'll find grace to help in time of need. There's plenty of grace there. Charles Spurgeon told of an evening when he was riding home after a heavy day's work. He said, I felt weary and depressed. When suddenly, he said, as a flash of lightning across my mind came 2 Corinthians 12, 9, My grace is sufficient for thee. And he thought, I should think it is, Lord. And he burst out laughing. He said, It seemed to make unbelief so absurd. It was as though some little fish, being very thirsty, was troubled about drinking the river dry. And the river said, Drink away, little fish. My stream is sufficient for thee. Or it seemed after the seven years of plenty, a mouse feared that it would die of famine. And Joseph might say, Cheer up, little mouse. My granaries are sufficient for thee. Or a man up on the mountain saying to himself, I fear I shall exhaust all the oxygen in the atmosphere. But the earth saying, Breathe away, O man, and fill thy lungs, for my atmosphere is sufficient for thee. Oh, God is sufficient for us. Everything we need. If we only knew that we sing, don't we? Jesus Christ is made to me. All I need. All I need. If we knew the treasure and the riches that's available for us in Jesus Christ, we are, we are abundantly rich this morning. Everything we need is in Him. Thank God for His grace. I don't know the trial you go through. I don't know what you're bearing this morning, but I know this, His grace is sufficient for you. Whether it's a health issue, how do you go through cancer? How do you go through a, a child that's struggling and, and, and not sure exactly what's causing, what's going on with your child? How do you go through the, the recovering from a surgery? How do you go through the testings and relationships? You know how you go through it? His grace is sufficient for you. Sovereign grace, His saving grace, His sufficient grace, His satisfying grace. But that's only the first word that He gives He wants to just praise God for. And we could sit a spell on grace, couldn't we? But notice secondly, verse 25 of Romans 16. Now to Him that is of power to establish you according to My Gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret, since the world began. Notice, he says, unto him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. The second word is gospel. You say, what is the gospel? 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that. Your, your Romans, right after Romans, is the book of Corinthians. Just turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, would you please? 1 Corinthians 15. We'll come back to Romans 16. 1 Corinthians 15. Notice Paul writes here in verse number 1. Would you look there with me? 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you what? The gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep a memory after I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. Well, here's what he received. He received the gospel. And here's what it is. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. There's the gospel. The gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hey, that's good news. That's good news because He died for me. 
That's good news because He died for you. But He didn't stay dead. He rose again the third day. Hey, a dead man can't save anybody. But a living person can. He conquered death. He conquered sin. He now lives and He's able to save all of those who come unto God by Him. We have a living Savior. Thank God for the Gospel. The message of the Gospel is the preaching of Jesus Christ. There is no gospel if you don't have Christ. It's the message of the gospel. Who He is and what He has done for us. It's the message of the love of God for mankind. It's the theme of the early church. The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the message of hope and it's the message of peace and it's the message of power. The gospel is the power to change people's life. Because it's Jesus Christ. He's the gospel. It's all about Him. And you don't, listen, you don't have the gospel if you don't have the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You have to have that. The message of the gospel. The ministry of the gospel. Notice what he said. Not him that have power to establish you according to my gospel. The word establish means to fix, to settle in a state for permanence, to make firm. You know what happens when you get saved by the gospel? When you get saved by Jesus Christ, you're settled. It settles you in a permanent state. Now you, you look at that and you tell me how you're ever going to lose the salvation that God gives you. It's an impossibility. But it has a settling effect when you receive Christ as your Savior. You're no longer carried about with everything that comes down the pike. You're no longer blown about by every wind of doctrine. You're, never, you're not blown about by the ups and downs of the world. You know, the, the standards of this world, as we've seen so clearly, they, 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 they come and go. They rise and fall. They change all the time. And people change. But the gospel and the message of the gospel and the ministry of the gospel has a stabilizing, settling effect on your life. And you're not all over the map anymore. You're settled and you're grounded and you're fixed and you're firm. You're forgiven. You're justified. And it's permanent. It's no longer, there's no longer uncertainty about why am I here? What am I doing? Where am I going? All those questions are answered when you receive Christ as your Savior. You're a child of God. You're, you are forgiven. Your name has been written in heaven. You now have a reservation. And the Bible says when the time comes, you take your last breath here, your next breath will be in heaven with the Lord Jesus. What a wonderful thing the Gospel is. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Stand on Christ. It establishes you. Thank God for the gospel. Hey, you want to praise God a while? Just, just take time to praise Him for His grace. You want to praise God? Take time to thank Him for the gospel. And thank Him that you lived in a country where you heard the gospel. Half of the world, over 3 billion people, almost 3.5 billion people, have not heard the gospel. Shame on us. The famous pastor up of the People's Church in Ontario, Canada, uh, for years and years, Oswald Smith said, why should anyone hear the gospel twice when so many have yet to hear it once? Boy, that's, that's so true. So many of us, we've heard it over and over and over again. Our, our children have heard it since they were in their diapers. We had, when our daughter Amy was born, she was born at a Christian college, and, and the fellas I hung around with, you know, they all wanted to be the first one to give the gospel to her, and they were preaching at her through the nursery window at the, at the hospital, you know. The, the little baby's in there. She's the only baby in there. So they're standing at the window and they got their New Testaments out. And buddy, they're letting her have it, you know. How can, bless God, how can you be two days old and not saved yet, you know, and uh, got to get the gospel. And uh, so, and, and they got kicked out of the hospital too, by the way. But um, they, I thank God for the gospel. I thank God I heard the gospel. 
And God, you, can, you heard it and you believe it. You think about, think about how many of you, how many of you have members of your family, brothers and sisters that are not saved? Anybody like that? Look at that. Why are you saved? Huh? Grace of God. The grace of God, that was you. You got to praise Him for His grace. Praise Him for the gospel. But you got to hear the gospel. What a blessing. You didn't, most of us didn't decide to live in the United States of America. We were born here. I didn't, my parents didn't consult me. Here I came, and I was born in America, and I got to hear the gospel. Thank God for that. Praise the Lord for the grace. Praise the Lord for the gospel. Verse number 27 of Romans 16. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. The third thing, third vocabulary of praise is glory. Glory is brightness. Glory is splendor. Glory is magnificent. It means you're, you're, you're shining the spotlight on somebody. That's, that's giving them the glory, giving them the spotlight. And God says here, the glory of God, we ought to shine the spotlight on God, not on ourselves. There's the glory of God's will. The Bible says in verse 26, it's now made manifest by the Scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. The gospel was secret. You know, a lot of times, the Old Testament, the Bible says it was those things, the gospel of Christ coming and dying on the cross and, and being our, our the Lamb of God. The, the prophets diligently inquired into that. They were curious about that. It was, it was a mystery to them. They didn't quite understand it all. You understand, we understand so much because we got the whole book. They didn't have that. And they were trying to, to take what they had and grasp it and understand it. But now it's made known. Now it's revealed to us. We have the blessing of having the completed Scriptures. We got the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say. Some of you don't even know who that is anymore, I guess. But It's the, the will of God. The glory of God's will. It's the will of God. Hey, it's the will of God that everybody hear the gospel. Just finished up our missions conference. Notice, it, notice what the verse said. He said here that it's the commandment of the everlasting God made known to who? All nations for the obedience of faith. Not just the nations we like. Not just the nations that are like us. Not just the nations that speak our language. Not just the nations that like us. All nations. Literally, all ethnos. All ethnic groups. The Bible, the Word of God, salvation, the Gospel, the grace of God. Everybody ought to know that. They ought to know it's not the will of God that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. It's the will of God that we be obedient to the faith. Obedient to the faith. You say, well, I'm saved. That's all that matters. No. What matters is are you being obedient to the faith? Are you living a life of obedience to God? That brings Him glory. The glory of God's will. Then there's the glory of God's wisdom. Verse 27 again. Do God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ? We spoke earlier about how only the infinite wisdom of God could have thought up the plan of salvation. The thinking, every other religion is man trying to figure out how to be right with God. Or man trying to do something to please God. No other religion has God coming to die for man. Their religions say man ought to die for God. Uh, Christianity says God came down and died for man. Nobody would think of that. No man would ever come up with that idea. No. Man says, be part of a religious system. Man says, observe these rituals. Man says, you keep these commandments. And all they've done is bog man down and blind them to the grace of God. 
Who would have come up with, let's have God become a man. Let's have Him become flesh and dwell among us. And live a perfect, sinless life. And then take our sins, all of man's sins upon Him. And suffer and bleed and die on a cross. And then three days later, have Him rise from the dead. And then let Him stay for 40 days. And then ascend back to heaven. Who would have thought of that? Not nobody but God. No one but God. And now, listen, anybody, anywhere, anytime, any place can call upon the name of the Lord and they can be saved. They can be saved. If they call on the Lord from Uganda, they can be saved. They call on the Lord from the Philippines, they can be saved. They call on the Lord from India. They can be saved. They call on the Lord from Japan. They can be saved. It doesn't matter where they are, anywhere, anytime, any place. What, what wisdom that God had to provide salvation like that. So I have the glory of God's will and the glory of God's wisdom, but then lastly, look at the glory of God's work. It's not only the God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. What God does, He does through His Son, Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ forever. Well, that makes sense to us, doesn't it? Because anything we do has to be done through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, put it this way, without me, ye can do nothing. Oh, wait a minute. I got up got dressed today. Didn't, I didn't ask Jesus to help me do that. Uh, you want Him to make it where you can't dress yourself? It can happen. It can happen. So what, 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 what made you wake up this morning anyway? The grace of God. We voluntarily go unconscious every night. You understand that? You voluntarily lay down, close your eyes, and you hope you'll, next thing you know, you wake up and six, seven, eight hours have gone by. You have no idea what's happened during that time. You're completely out of it. Isn't God gracious to wake us up? To give us another day? And He, he does all that He does through Jesus Christ. I'm saved by Jesus Christ. I have access to God through Jesus Christ. I have an advocate for my prayers to God. It's Jesus Christ. Everything we do is done through Jesus Christ. And being aware that I have to do it through Him. That's why the, the blessings we receive, we receive through Jesus Christ. The power to serve is done through Jesus Christ. Everything God does in our life is done through Jesus Christ. What God does in this world, He does through His Son, Jesus Christ. That's why God says, you can't honor me if you don't honor my Son. You can't know me if you don't know my Son. You can't say, I know God, but I don't know about Jesus. Well, you don't know God. No man comes to the Father but by me, Jesus said. So you have to know the Son. That's why Paul said, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. As we follow Christ and we exalt Christ and we please Christ and we obey Christ, that brings glory to God. That shines the spotlight on God. We don't ever say, well, I did this and I did that. No, what you should say is, well, the Lord helped me do this. The Lord helped me do that. By God's grace, this got done. By God's grace, I was able to do this. Make sure that it's not me, it's Him. One of the missionaries said it. Remember, more of, more of me, less of you, than some of me, some of you, and on to where it was, no, none of me, all of you. All of you. That's what he's getting to. That brings glory to God. Let me share this with you. Dr. A.J. Jacobs is an acclaimed author. He, he's known for immersing himself in his research. 
when he wrote a book called The Know-It-All, he read an entire set of the Encyclopedia Britannica. He spent another year living like an Old Testament Hebrew. And in one of his unique preparations and research, he embraced the original version of Thanksgiving. He came to realize it was quite a celebration with games, riddles, races, contests, and foods like eel and lobster. But most profound to Jacob's was the realization that this time of gratitude in 1621 followed a year in which 48 of the original 100 pilgrims had died. Scurvy and exposure claimed half of them. Yet they met and rejoiced with thanksgiving. And his conclusion was, if they could appreciate life amid such chaos, pain, and uncertainty, I could give thanks for all the good things in my relatively cushy life. Couldn't we all? Couldn't we all? The vocabulary of praise. What's the vocabulary of praise, Paul? Well, it's the grace of God. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's the glory of God. Boy, when you get a little discouraged, when you feel that discouragement or despondency begin on you, you say, I just ought to praise the Lord. Where do I start? You start with grace. You go to the gospel. And you go to His glory. The glory of God. That's the vocabulary of praise. And God inhabits the praises of His people. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Listen, you'll find yourself not depressed. You'll find yourself not discouraged. Praise will lift you out of that. It's in our songbook. I don't know what page it is, but it's, I will praise Him. I will praise Him. Praise the Lamb for sinners slain. Give Him glory, all ye people, for His blood can wash away each stain. I will praise Him. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank You for this morning. Thank You, Lord, for Paul putting this doxology here at the end of Romans. Thank you, Lord, for the vocabulary of praise. And God, we need to praise you more. We're like that Duke of Wellington who said, if I could do it over again, I would give more praise. Lord, so often it's so easy to complain. It's so easy to find the negative. God, help us to be people of praise. Praise to our God. Praise you for your grace. Praise you for the gospel. Praise you for your glory. We love you this morning, Lord. I pray that you've used the message in the heart of people here this morning. That, Lord, we'll walk out the doors in a few minutes saying, I will praise the Lord. Thank God, thanking you for your grace and thanking you for the gospel. Thanking you for your glory. I pray that whatever we do, will do all to the glory of God. That the spotlight will always be on you and not on us. Speak to hearts this morning.